is very valuable as documentation and it is good music. So look for it. I never composed anything with this machine. When I arrived at McGill, it was already uh, non-functioning proper. I use the Springer array. That's why I know I speak so highly of it. I could just use inputs and outputs and do something with that. And I did many demonstrations because mechanically it was running, but there were too many little things wrong in terms of electronics, and we couldn't find the parts that we didn't make it work. I don't remember very much about what's under here. You, you remember what it is? Besides storage and components, I, I don't think there is anything to do with, with uh, processing the sound. I think it's for access to the components. Uh -huh. Yeah, you can see here, in addition to uh, being able to play the keyboard to manipulate, you could have some preset transpose and determine the range of add vibrato. It was a composing machine. But as I said before about the oscillator band, it was always with me that physical sensation that you are a sculpture dealing with something. You can touch the sound. This is not numerical digits, okay, from the computer screen. You can do it. So in a way, it's a, maybe it's a, a hybrid, because in order to do whatever you wanted, grips of it, there were so many splices. So in that sense, you can say, no splicing, but it was splicing. And he did drips of it. And, but then to feel that you have all these six loops running at the same time, and you can move it. Mm -hmm. You just set yourself, OK. Everything is running, I hear nothing, but now during six minutes, I'm going to do a six minutes composition. Try it, it works. Okay. Any questions about this? One additional feature is the uh, glide stricter. Rather than uh, having a steps uh, increase in speed uh, of the tape drive, you could also run your finger along the strip to get a, uh, a, more, uh, a more gradual. Yeah, like design. Yeah. Um, if it applies, I might tell you the way it states in my me memory how the cane did drips of it with a similar early prototype. But the best is get it from the music library, this Hugh Lecane composition CD, or buy your own copy, because the CD includes one track lasting about five minutes, six minutes with the voice of Hugh Lecane, where he describes how he did Dripsody over one night. He got the idea, made recordings by using an eyedropper to drop uh, a drop of water on a bucket with water. And he experimented with having little water or much water and where to put the microphone until he got a good recording of one <laughs> drop of water. Then he recopied that tape, making I don't know how many other copies. I don't know, probably he already used a speed variation at that point to get that ping, to go ping, ping, okay? You use little speed variation other, uh, in either direction, there will be not too much difference on the attack or the length of the decay, and it's still usable. And by recopying those three copies, already slightly transformed, he made the six stereo loops and started fooling around with them until he, all this overnight, and he felt he was ready and did the, the monophonic first version of Tripsody, which is about a minute, a few seconds. It has been released commercially. But then, 10 years later maybe, he did the stereo version uh, the piece would be very successful, so uh, he brought it to two minutes and a few seconds. Let's say 35% longer using the same materials, and that's the way that is uh, approved by the composer and is better known the stereo version. In the CD that I'm talking about, both versions are included, plus 
the little report from the cane, from the horse's mouth, how he did. By himself, and he was surrounded by people around the NRC, that's National Research Council, and the government that saw that what uh, he wanted to do after he had been working already into nuclear physics, right? he also prior and during the Second World War was working on the development of radar, both in Canada and then he was sent to England when he went into this nuclear physics, but always experimenting with his own, uh, developing the SACPAT, the one we saw before. Have in mind that even the SACPAT was touch sensitive because those keys move vertically but also laterally. So he was after that. Uh, so he was probably one of the first to uh, read, uh, write and read reports at the Audio Engineering Society about touch sensitivity, about polyphony synthesizers, about voltage control, even if he only called it control. But uh, I still have not seen a filter, I don't remember, most voltage control. Uh, so in a way, he was a true pilot. Did you want to talk about the polyphony? Yes, we have to do that. Yeah. Hewlett came. It's kind of a big guy. As I said before, I met him in Toronto when Mr. Chepsky told me I was going to some festival or convention. He said, Ask, you have to meet Hewlett Um He didn't talk too much. Um, and most of his machines came perhaps with technical manuals, but not with user's manual. So we always have to find our own way how to use the machines or write little guidelines or manuals to be able to recopy it and give it to students. So how to use machines. But he was very responsive. He was always open to ideas. And he was asking the composer, where well, you use my machine how shall I improve it? Do you have any other new ideas? 